to you brothers and sisters um it's a blessing to be here with you guys man it is february the 5th man i'm telling you this 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 year is already fast running away from us we're already in the second month of it and the reference number for this morning is reference number 366 um it's a pleasure to be here with you guys man like i said before we all have had experiences this past week since last Monday. Some of those experiences have been disheartening, discouraging, and some of those experiences have been blessings and have built up our faith. No matter what the type of experience it is, just know that at the foundation of all things, there is God, and that he is the one that will use either the positive and the negative to draw us closer to him. So do not murmur, do not complain. Whether it is physical sickness, whether it's a mental depravity, whether it's a lack of funds, whatever the situation might be, go through it gracefully, realizing that you are not going through it alone, that you are going through it with a savior that is there holding your hand and having his hand outstretched towards you. This morning, we are discussing once again, as we have been doing for the last three weeks prior to today, why a man or a woman should study the fruits of the Spirit. Now, last week in lesson number three, we identified how we are to bear fruit and the process therein involved. We explored scriptures such as Romans chapter 8, verse 5, with special emphasis on key words that unlocked a deeper meaning of the text. And we also looked at John chapter 15, verse 4 through 5. Yet in today's study, however, we're going to discuss the process involved in requesting the Spirit and its fruits versus having the fruit of the flesh already in place. Now the question is asked, who will the Holy Spirit be poured out on? And to illustrate that in a more practical manner, I want us to consider for a moment the beggar, the panhandler, that individual that we see when we come up to the light as we exit the intersection that's standing there with a cup or a can. It's interesting when you think about this person because, first of all, the first perception of this person is that they're a drunk or they're a drug addict, and because of their habits, they find themselves in this position. And this might be true. We look at them and we can tell right away their position because, number one, they're on the side of the, of the road on the street corner, and then they're begging. We can identify rather quickly now, some of us may have a heart to where we are compassionate. Others of us, we tend to figure that, you know, because they find themselves in this position due to some mistake or poor decision on their own, we're going to not bother with them because, hey, they're going to take that money we give them and use it for drugs anyway, right? But there's something interesting about the panhandler or the beggar that, that I wanted to draw our attention to. These are people who are, number one, desperate for something. And they are willing, number two, to beg for what it is that they need. Now, it would be easy, we perceive, for them to go and get a job. And we say, or I say that it would be easy as far as our perception would go because we don't know the full story. We just see a begging individual on the side of the street or in the front of Walmart or in the front of a department store begging. We don't really know their situation. We don't know if they're in the position they're in because they were a drug addict or an alcohol uh, abuser. We really don't know. And unless we stopped and asked and, and figured out this person, we wouldn't know. But one thing we can definitely say is that they are determined. 
that they don't give up easily. You'll see them walking behind individuals going to their car and the person is doing their best to ignore them. But they're still walking behind them requesting, begging, uh, desiring something, right? There's a lesson there. In Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13, it reads this way. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Hmm. I'm going to look at Luke 11 once again now, brothers and sisters. Except this time, I'm going to focus my attention on verses 9 and 10, replacing certain words with their Greek and Hebrew meaning. Now, here we go. And I say unto you, crave or need it, and it shall be delivered to you. Require or advance towards it, and ye shall obtain. Utter vigorously, and it shall be not fenced in or obstructed from you. For everyone that craves for or needs something will take it. And he that requires or advances towards it shall obtain it. And to him that utters vigorously, it will not be fenced in or obstructed. Does it make sense now why there is a lesson to be learned from the begging individual? When we plunged in deeper to the scripture and we replaced a few key words with their original meanings, we identified a few things. We wanted to identify the process involved in requesting the spirit. This was the first objective of today's lesson, right? Now notice how Jesus used the verb ask there six times times and then he replaced ask and emphasized it with seek twice seek being an action word then twice more he used the word knock which is also an action word this emphasis or this emphasis on this action or on these actions must be taken or we must take a look at this emphasis and realize that these are the things that must be done in order for us to receive the spirit and its fruits. There is great emphasis placed on this. Ten times we are told either to knock, ask, or seek. Just like the beggar continuously, constantly begs until he gets the desired effect, we must continuously be begging, knocking, seeking, looking for the gift of the Spirit in order to receive it. And with that same intensity of the beggar, we must be coming to Christ with the same intensity because anything that is to be desired must be what? sought after. We learned that last week. Anything to be desired must be sought after. We must ask or crave six times as in, according to Luke 11, 9 through 10. We must seek or advance towards as it was shared with us twice 
and then we must knock or utter vigorously an additional two times as was prescribed in Luke 11, verse 9 through 10. So we see now that there's emphasis placed on action on our part to receive something. There has to be action on our part in order to receive something. We went through it last week. We discussed for a little while the, 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 the process involved when a man is interested in a woman or when a woman is interested in a man and how we will go beyond the depths of our emotions to grasp that person's attention and to have them become a part of our lives. We also talked about the process involved when it comes to receiving an education. We have been encouraged this morning thus far in the book of Luke that we must ask, knock, seek, ask, knock, seek. And although it's been given 10 times there, I would suggest to you and I, as well as to myself, that we must ask, knock, seek, ask, knock, and seek more than 10 times. Now, am I saying within one prayer? Well, perhaps, it depends upon your desire. But what I am saying is throughout the course of your existence, throughout the course of our religious experience, we must be asking, knocking, seeking, seeking, asking, knocking, knocking, asking, seeking, and continuously doing this. Look at a child. They will not stop. I have a daughter, a four-year-old daughter. We will go into the grocery store. And I almost loathe having to take her with me because I know there's going to be something she's going to see and that she's going to beg for. And one particular day we went into the grocery store and you know how in the stores now, when you go to the register, they have all the candies and the little toys right in the child's view as to tempt the parent to purchase these things. This is a parent, you're not really paying attention to it. And some of us, we are, you know, we like candy and different things of this nature. But it's, it, it's specifically placed there to grasp the attention of the child. And she saw some candy and boy, let me tell you, she did not stop until I was moved to purchase that candy. Daddy, please, please, I want, I want, please, let me have, can I, can I, please, daddy, I want, I do you see the illustration? It was not until she basically wore me out that I went and purchased these items for because I really didn't want her to have it. But at the same time, she was so determined and the Holy Spirit immediately said to me, you see how determined a child is when they are desiring something? Why is it that we become, when we become adults, we are no longer determined to ask for certain things? Now, we are still determined. It is just now that our determination has been placed on the wrong things. Just as a child is willing to beg, just as a beggar, a panhandler is willing to beg vehemently to receive something, this must be our course of action. Now for objective number two. We're going to go to Romans chapter 7 verse 23. That was Romans 7, 23, and it says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Remember the two objectives? We wanted to perceive and we wanted to look at how we should receive the fruit of the Spirit. That's objective number one. And objective number two, we wanted to realize how it is that the fruit of the flesh is already with us. Because there's a contrast there. One, we must ask for, we must beg for, we must, put, we, we must go forward in faith, constantly looking and seeking for, while the other is with us. We just read in Romans 7, 23, but I see another law in my members 
warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So I'm going to look at that scripture once again. We're going to replace key words there with their original Greek and Hebrew meanings, and we're going to read it this way. But I see another principle in my body warring against the principle or the distinctive ruling opinion of my mind and bringing me into slavery to the law of sin, which is in my body. Notice how the gift of the Spirit is sought after, requested, and desired for, but the law of sin or the fruits of the flesh are already present within us. Now, for more on that specific idea and study, I would refer you back to lessons number one and two. But let us look at one more sp uh, scripture dealing with the fruit of the flesh. That scripture is found in James chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Hmm. Look at Romans 7, 23 again, before we go any deeper into James chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. I want to go back and look at Romans 7, 23. It says that I see another law in my members. I see another law within me. This law is a contrast. It is different from what I perceive in God's word, what I perceive through the spirit. And this law, this distinctive ruling opinion is bringing me into slavery to the law that is within me. Now, if something is placed within you, I'm trying to draw our minds into deep thought. If something is already in you or with you, it only takes for it to be agitated for it to come out, right? Right? If the seasoning is already in the pot, all it takes is for us to stir the pot so, and then all of a sudden the smell or the aroma of that seasoning fills the room, fills the kitchen, fills the home because the seasoning is in. It reminds me of the commercial, Dell, it's all inside, it's all inside you. The propensity to do wrong, the desire to do wrong, we do not have to seek after this. Then we go back to James chapter 1, verse 14 through 15. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away, what? Of his own lust. This, uh, this denotes that, again, there is something already within us and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, Bring it forth death. So we're going to read this again. And we're going to read it in a manner in which to unlock the deep treasures found within. But every man is examined. Mercy. I, I, when I saw that word examine, what is an examination? It is a process that is taken on, or taken in that suggests we're searching something. And it says that we are being examined or being enticed from within. That is what that which is within us is examining that which is placed within us through the spirit. The flesh is warring against the spirit and examining how strong the spirit within us is. You see, because they're warring against one another, the flesh and the spirit. So the spirit examines the flesh to see if it is truly dead. And the flesh examines the spirit to see if it is truly alive. 
mercy. But every man is examined when he is enticed of his own forbidden desires. Then, when his own forbidden desires have arrested and seized him, it bringeth forth offense or sin. And the offense of sin, when it is entirely complete, bringeth forth deadly consequences and eventually death. Do we see the contrast here? Have we perceived that the gift of the Spirit is just that. It must be given, but it is given as we request it. We must be determined, like the child in the store wanting candy or toys. We must be determined, like the panhandler or the beggar on the side of the street or in front of the department store begging for something, to receive something. Determination is serious. And when we lack determination, when we lack the far sight in order to realize that it's going to take effort to receive any good gift, then we won't receive it. And on the flip side of that, we've examined through the two scriptures shared that the flesh or the fruit of the flesh is already within us. We don't have to request it. We nearly need to stir it up. And when it is stirred up, when we're enticed away by this principal opinion that is already placed within us, we find that we will do that which this opinion suggests because this opinion is truly opinionated. It wants to do what it wants to do. Now the spirit wants to do something with us as well. But because the spirit is not naturally placed within, it has to be given permission. Whereas the flesh, the fruits of the flesh, naturally being placed within us, it just takes control. It doesn't ask for our permission. That is why the flesh may jump when we see certain things on television or when we see certain things walking past us in the street. So our flesh may jump within us when we're driving out in the community and we smell the aroma of some type of food that we know we should not eat because it's already inside of you. And that's why then there is a war now going on when we have invited the spirit to come in, when we've knocked, seek, and asked for the spirit to come in. There's a war now placed within us because the spirit is warring against the natural inclinations that are already inside of us. So praise God for the war. Because if there was no controversy, that means that we are submitting and have put up the white flag and have submitted ourselves to the flesh. And this is truly when we're in danger. If there is a controversy, if there is a war, if there is a battle, that means that we are holding on by faith to the spirit and asking that the spirit take us over into pastures green and into pastures of peace. Because in truth, if we allow the flesh to take over, we already know the outcome. We need only look and examine at our lives in the past when we've allowed the flesh to take over, when we've allowed the opinion of the flesh to carry us in to sinful action. We need only look at that to perceive the outcome of it. Brothers and sisters, we need only look now at the spirit through faith, realizing that it is faith in the spirit that is requested, that is knocked for and sought after. Once it is within us, it too will carry us on. And we can realize then as a result of having the spirit within us that, hey, you know what? I don't have to do what this, the flesh is suggesting. I don't have to go that direction. I don't have to go that way. And when we come to that realization, there is peace in the midst of the storm. The storm is the flesh crying out to you saying, feed me. But because Jesus is in the midst of the boat, in the form of his Holy Spirit, there is peace. 
if we are not experiencing peace, quite frankly, it's because Jesus is not in the boat and the spirit is not dwelling with us and we are giving in to the flesh and it is causing great strife. Let's be honest with ourselves. Now, thus far in the four lessons that we've had to date, we've gone through the working of the Spirit. We've studied the Holy Spirit. We've looked at the current state of carnal man and realized that because of our mental and physical depravity, we are in serious need of the Spirit. But on our next study, we will compare the fruit of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit and identify the contrasts. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it is such a blessing for us to perceive and to understand how we receive the Spirit versus how the fruit of the flesh is already present in us. And it is a blessing because just the action of asking and begging for something carries us away from the flesh and puts us in a spiritual mind of faith because to beg for something means that we must wait and be faithful to receive what we've asked for. That is not a carnal practice because in truth to be carnally minded is to merely call upon that which we already have. That's not faith. But to be spiritually minded is to call upon your power to provide something for us that we do not naturally possess. That's faith. And I thank you that you have designed it thus. You are a mighty, magnificent, powerful, omnipotent God. And the way that you design things is unrivaled. We praise your name this morning and we give you thanks that the spirit is with us. We request the spirit. We vehemently knock. We vehemently seek. We vehemently ask so that it would subdue the opinionated mindset of the flesh. And in Jesus name we pray. Amen.